the name of Jesus. I said, do you believe there's power in the name of Jesus? Come on, lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, he's good in the church. He does great and mighty things. And he deserves great and mighty power and praise. Come on, lift him up today. Lift him up today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is good. God is good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He deserves all praise and honor. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. He has no rival. He has no equal. There's no one like our God. He does what no one else can do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. One more time, give him some praise today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated. And then this worship team do a good job. Don't they always do a good job? I'm just really thankful for them and thankful for Kim and her leadership and Peanut and Jamie and all of them that sing. And I'm thankful for my family too. But, uh, but they do a wonderful job. They really do. And I just appreciate them. Uh, kids and, and teachers could go ahead and go to class. I about, about forgot. We're having class for everyone today, including the nursery. So um, they can go ahead and make their way that way. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to a couple of places, first of all, if you want to turn to Mark chapter 5, then Matthew chapter 21. Mark chapter 5, then Matthew chapter 21. We'll get to those in just a minute, but I want to read just one scripture right now. We're going to start this last week, uh, and for the sake of not keeping you here until the sun went down, I cut it short, I guess. So, But I want to continue on this topic, and the verse is from 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. The topic is get out. Turn to your neighbor and say, <laughs> It's good to have you in the house of the Lord today. All right. Turn to your neighbor and say, It's good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this day, the opportunity to be here opportunity to be in your house and lord i pray now that you would bless your word touch me lord i need your anointing but not just me but all that here lord bless them today as well we give you praise we give you honor it's in the name of jesus we pray amen you can turn around and wave at a few people give them a hug or a high five or tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the lord today amen amen get out we started this last week, this, this topic, and uh, we'll finish it up today, Lord willing. It's hard to make a month-long sermon into, you know, one, one Sunday, so. Um, we talked last week about this phrase, get out. It's more than just leave, you know, more than just move on or, you know, we don't want you here anymore. It has more of a negative connotation to it. It uh, implies a rudeness or a forcefulness. It's like in all caps with excited marks at the end. You know what excited marks are, right? It's a get out. That's kind of how it, it gives the impression. But the context here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we talked a little bit about this last week, that you know, it's Paul speaking to the issue of influence, and he's suggesting not that Christians should never associate with, with unbelievers, but that the principle here is that we should be in the world, but not of the world. It's just like a ship that is to be in the water, but the water isn't supposed to be in the ship. That would not be a good thing. 
But being a Christian is more than just adding the ways of God to your life. It is getting out the ways of the world. And we looked at a couple of folks and examples of people who had some get out experiences and how that that might have applied to our lives. When first of all, we looked at Joshua and Joshua was crossing the Jordan to go into the promised land. It was a, uh, a second baptizing, if you will. We talked about it being the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not a crossing of a sea where the, the waters part and you go down and rise up to a new life, which signifies water baptism. This was a crossing of, the, of a river where the flow stopped and you would go through and you come out the other side to a promise. And the promise was Jesus's promise to us about the Holy Spirit and part of get, going over is getting out getting out of dryness getting out of a rut getting out of the wilderness and stepping into the fruit of the Spirit then we talked also about Jonah and how that you know they threw him overboard they grabbed him and threw him overboard and said get out of the ship because we're sinking and we talked about disobedience and how that if we're not careful we can allow things into our lives that don't belong there things in your life that are disobedient and until you start obeying and getting the disobedience out then you're never going to achieve some things that God wants to achieve you're always going to have storms raging until you're uh, you get that disobedience out. You'll never have peace until you start obeying. And there's things that we fully know that the Lord doesn't necessarily want us to do or the Lord's not involved in, and yet we still find ourselves doing those. And so those are the things we need to get out. And today I want to go into the New Testament and talk about a guy by the name of Jarius. His story is found in Mark chapter 5, and hopefully you've had time to turn there. And Mark 5, I want to read a couple of verses. Verse 21 says, And when Jesus was passed over again by a boat unto the other side, many people gathered unto him, and he was near unto the sea. And behold, there comes unto him uh, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and many people followed him and crowded him. Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. It was what I guess people would consider today to be a religious leader. He was a, uh, I guess in modern day times, it would be like he was a pastor. You know, it was his responsibility to have the, to be the spiritual leader of the community or the spiritual leader of a, of a congregation. Uh, he also was a spiritual leader of his family. And you can tell that because he comes to Jesus, because his daughter is sick, right? His responsibility is to the community, but it's also to his family. And I have found that out, that as a pastor, you're, I'm responsible for you. Did you know that? So if I call and check on you or, or you miss church, it's not that I'm hounding you. I, I'm responsible for you. And so it's my responsibility as a pastor to check on the sheep. But my first responsibility is, is to my family. My first responsibility is to be a spiritual leader of my home. And I can't be a spiritual leader if I don't follow Jesus, right? And so some of you, if you're struggling with being a spiritual leader, it, you need to get close to Jesus because he will lead you. He will help you. He will, he will show you what to do to be a spiritual leader. My responsibility is to love my wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I am to teach my children about Jesus, not just his shed blood on Calvary that washes away our sins. We should teach them that, but also to show them grace and to display mercy and to exhibit worship and to express love. I am to be an image of an earthly father so that they can see the heavenly father. I should be a reflection of what God is. They should be able to look at me and get a glimpse of what God is like by looking at their earthly father. I am to imitate Jesus. 
Jesus in both word and deed. Teach them to love God and teach them to fear God. That's what a spiritual leader does. And I need to be that. And then when they need Jesus... I should be the one to stand in the gap. I should be the one to be able to get to the feet of Jesus and cry out and say, hey, I've got a daughter that needs to be touched. I should be able to touch heaven for my children, touch heaven for my wife, touch heaven for you as a congregation because I am a spiritual leader. And Jarius displays here the characteristics of a spiritual leader. And I think a lot of you probably know this story. It is a story of Jarius, but it's also a story of a woman with an issue. Because you can't tell the story of Jarius. I stopped a little short in the reading. You can't tell the story of Jarius without telling the story that happens within the story. And what happens is Jesus says yes to Jarius. I'll go with you. I'll go to your house. And on his way there, he is confronted by a woman and we would think just looking at the story that she is an interruption of what's going on you know Jairus is trying to get Jesus he's in an emergency situation right he's he's trying to lead Jesus he's trying to pull him toward where the, his house is and to show him come and touch my daughter it's it's very touch and go you got to hurry or if you don't if you're not going to make it in time she's going to pass away so we need you to hurry and so Jesus is going but the crowd is thick and there's people everywhere and he can't get through the crowd and and as he's making his way through there the Bible says that a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years came and just said within herself if I could just touch the hem of his garment then I will be made whole so she fights her way through the crowd she reaches out touches the hem of his garment just the very bottom of his of his garment and she is healed and I can just see Jerry is saying Jesus, come on, we don't have time for this. Uh, you, you know, I'm trying to, trying to get through the crowd, and he's pushing, he's keeping an eye on where Jesus is, and he looks up, and Jesus is gone. He's thinking, I lost Jesus. And so he's got to go back and find him. When he does, she's having a, he's having a conversation with this woman. But see, we think looking at this story on the level that she is an interruption or a disruption or a distraction or a delay in what Jesus is trying to accomplish. But she's not an interruption. She needs healing just like Jairus' daughter needs healing. And let me say this. If you're seeking Jesus, then you're never an interruption to the service. If you're seeking Jesus, you can always come to this altar and find you a place to pray. It doesn't matter if service has just started or if they've not even sung a song yet or if we're taking up the offering or, or they're singing you know, their fifth song. It doesn't matter. As any time, even during the preaching, if you feel like you need to seek Jesus, you're never an interruption when you're going to find him, okay? You never are an interruption when you're really trying to, to seek Jesus you have an open invitation not just from me but from him to come to him at all times and to seek him and Jarius and this woman are opposites but yet they are connected they're both desperate they both want a healing and they both need to get to where Jesus is at and that just shows us that we don't live our life in a bubble we're connected to one another and what happens to one affects other people as well. But these people, Jarius and this lady, are opposites. He's a man, she's a woman. He's mentioned by name, they never mention her name in the Bible. He is honor and res honored and respected. She is shamed and rejected. He is a leader of a synagogue, and because of her medical condition, she can't even approach the synagogue. He has money, he's well to do, he's affluent. She has no money. The Bible says she spent all of her money on doctors and instead of getting better, she got worse. 
So they're completely opposite from each other. But you know what? Life has a way of leveling the playing field. Life has a way of making us all equal on the same ground. Because there's things that happen in your life that your money can't get you out of. That your position can't get you out of. That your status can't get you out of. That your education can't get you out of. There's things that happen in your life that you're going to be in the same situation as somebody else. Something that only Jesus can get you out of. Something that only God can touch you. And the very basis of that is that we're all sinners and we all need grace and we all need Jesus. You can't save yourself. Jesus levels the playing field and said all have sinned. All needs to come. Whosoever will come can be saved. They couldn't be more opposite and yet they're in the same boat because they need Jesus like we all need Jesus amen we need Jesus in our lives don't we hallelujah and that's kind of what the church is all about it's a place for us to connect to one another we come from different backgrounds we come from different situations we have different issues we have different statuses we have different problems we have different incomes we have we live in different places but yet we all come together and one time on a Sunday morning to worship the God that we serve because we all have to fall at the feet of Jesus doesn't matter your education doesn't matter your status doesn't matter your position doesn't matter what problems you have we all have to bow at the feet of Jesus it's funny how that people can be in the same space and yet have different outlook amen an example of that is right here today some of you are probably cold and some of you are probably hot you're in the same space and yet you're just having a different outlook happens to me and my wife every time we get in the car I'm thinking, it is so hot in here. And she's sitting literally six or eight inches away saying, I'm freezing. It's so cold in here. And I'm like, you're burning me up. I can't stand the heat. So I should get out of the kitchen, right? So roll my window down or do something. But it's funny, we can be in the same space and have different views. We had opportunity this week to, uh, to, to go to, out of town. Amelia had a volleyball tournament that we were blessed to be able to go to. And so we spent a couple of nights away from home. And, and one morning I, I got up early and uh, left Angela and Amelia back at the, at the room. And I went and ate me a big, big, big breakfast. It was all you could eat for twelve ninety five, And I got about $50 worth, let me tell you. <laughs> I had a biscuit about the size of your fist and gravy and bacon and eggs. And that was just my first plate. <laughs> then I went back and got French toast and pancake and bacon and eggs. Then I went back and got some fruit because that pineapple just looked too good to pass up. And then after I had, you know, three or four cups of coffee, I went back and got some more eggs and some more bacon. <laughs> Man, I tell you, I had to repent. I ate so much. I was stuffed. But as I was leaving and was getting ready to pay for my meal, I was only, you know, one of my family. I was just a table of one. You know, it looked like five people had eaten there. There were plates all over the place. You know, and they're like, where did the rest of your party? I'm like, they're right here, baby. And so I get ready to, to leave to pay, and I go to, and there's two ladies behind the counter, and it's kind of a little mom and pop shop, you know, so they, they were probably all you know, related or cousins or something. And so um, I'm talking to him, and she says, you have such a deep voice. And I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> and I said, well, I am a preacher. And she said, oh, you're a Baptist preacher? And I said, no, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. And the, the lady said, well, what's, what's the difference? And the lady beside her said, I don't think there's much difference at all. And I said, no, it's really all about Jesus, right? It really is all about Jesus. So it really doesn't matter where you come from. It really doesn't matter your circumstance. It really doesn't matter your denomination or your situation or your complication or your desperation. You still have to come to the feet of Jesus because that's where the leveling ground is. That's where the, the it all levels out is at the feet of Jesus. And desperate times calls for desperate things. And Darius was desperate. He was willing to leave his family 
they leave the synagogue and go seek out Jesus because his daughter needed to be healed. And yet this woman who had an issue of blood had the same situation where she needed Jesus. Different person, completely opposite, but she still needed healing and she was willing to fight through the crowd to get to the feet of Jesus. Desperate times will cause you to do desperate things. See, when you're in desperation, it'll cause you to come to church early. When you're in a desperate situation, it'll cause you to pray more. It'll cause you to come to church and lift up your hands and give God praise and seek him and you don't care who's looking and you don't care no matter what it looks like. It'll cause you to cry and put on your ugly face when you're crying and tears running down your face and you don't care if your hair gets messed up or your shirt gets untucked. It'll cause you to run to the altar and be a bow down before him when you're desperate you don't care what people think when you're desperate you just need to get a hold of God and you're willing to cry out and willing to pour out and willing to seek him when you're desperate and they were desperate for Jesus and I don't have time to get into all the the details of this story of the girl being 12 years old and the woman having an issue of blood of 12 years and man that's a whole nother sermon right there but Jairus was in an emergency situation. And this woman comes and touches Jesus. And we see it maybe as an interruption or at the very least a delay. And Jesus says, who touched me? And they say, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. It's all we can do to keep people from touching you. He's like, no, no, I'm not talking about people bumping into me. I'm talking about somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. And I want to know who it was. And the Bible says in verse 33 that, that she comes to him. Let me find it here. She says that, the, the Bible says that, that she knows that it was her. And so she comes to him. And it says, And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. One version says she told him her whole story. Could you imagine poor Jarius? <laughs> This woman, now listen ladies, I love you, but I've heard some of you tell your whole story. And it's like, might as well get a comfortable seat because it's going to take a while. So she's telling the whole story and Jairus is thinking, would you please, you just got your healing, come on, I've got, I'm in a hurry, time is of the essence. And yet, you're taking, you're taking up all this time, you got what you want, let him go, let Jesus come. And right then, the story changes. The story changes. It's a turning point right there. Because they come to Jairus and says, it's too late. It's too late. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Because it's too late. Too late. And just when you think that it's over, that's when Jesus takes over. Amen. That's when Jesus takes over. And when Jesus takes over, everything changes when he takes over. Everything begins to shift when Jesus takes over. And instead of Jairus trying to lead Jesus and bring him to his house, Jesus then takes the lead. Jesus says, don't worry, Jairus. Be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. I will take the lead. And if you're a spiritual leader, you need to understand that you got to follow Jesus. No matter who you are or what you do, you need to follow Jesus. And this is what the Bible says in verse 35. It's highlighted in my Bible because it is a turning point of this story. And while he yet spoke to the woman who had an issue of blood, or she's telling her whole story, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, a certain, who, a certain person who said, Thy daughter is dead, while troublest the master any further. As soon as Jesus heard these words that were spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he permitted no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And we think that they're all holy and that they get, you know, to get to private, you know, invitations and that they're special. I think they, them three just stayed in trouble all the time. And Jesus just didn't want them wandering too far off. And he's like, you know what? You people need to hang by me a little bit. That's kind of what I think with Peter, James, and John's. And so he comes into the house of the ruler of the synagogue and sees the turmoil. Those that are crying and those that are weeping and those that are welling great. And he says, and when he has come in, he said unto them, 
Why make you this ado and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeps. And the Bible says in verse 40, and they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he takes the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered in to where the child was laying. And he took the child by the hand and said unto her, which is to say, being interpreted, little girl, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway she come forth and was alive. Her breath came back into her. See, Jesus takes over. Jesus takes over this situation. It's a dead situation. It's a, it's a situation that, that, that people don't think it is ever going to get a healing. They don't think it's too, they think it's too late. But just when you think that it's over, Jesus can take a dead situation and turn it around. Amen? Jesus said, stop crying. She's just asleep. And all these people, see back in those days, they would hire people to be professional mourners. Because the thought was that the family had cried so much and weeped so much that they needed to bring in somebody else to help do their crying and do their weeping. And so you've got these professional criers who are crying. Oh, it's so sad. Oh, how pitiful. And they're crying. And they're crying. And when Jesus comes in and says, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. They go from crying to laughing. <laughs> really? You can tell they're not sincere, right? You can tell they're fake people. You ever been around fake people? You can tell, right? They could tell they were fake people because they immediately started laughing. See, unbelief will laugh in the face of faith. Unbelief will laugh at faith and say, it's impossible. You can't do it. But Jesus says to get out. Get that thinking out of here. Get those negative thoughts out of here. Because Jesus has nothing to do with people who don't believe his promises. He has nothing to do with people who don't believe his power. He drove them out. He told them to get out so that they would not discourage the faith of Jairus. Jesus says, oh, you're laughing because you think it's over? You're laughing because because you don't think I can do anything that she's dead and that it's gone. It's not over. Get out because let me show you I can take a dead situation and I can bring it back to life. She's not dead. She's just asleep. It's not over. I still have the final say. And so some of you need to hear this today that God's not done with you. He's not finished with you. It's not over yet. Just because you think it's over doesn't mean that it's over. God's not done. He has has the final say he can take that relationship that's dead and he can bring it back to life he can take that marriage that's dead and he can bring it back to life he can take that job that you thought was gone and he can bring it back to life he can take that calling or that ministry that you thought was over and he can bring it back to life those that are out in sin and you think they'll never be saved it's not over God can bring it back to life that which the devil has tried to, to kill you with and steal and destroy God can take it and turn it around it's not dead it's just asleep <laughs> hallelujah it's not over it's not dead and see usually we have to get up before we can get out you got to get up out of the bed before you can get out of the house you got to get up out of the chair before you can leave the office You've got to get up out of the pew before you can come to the altar. You've got to get up before you can get out. But in this situation, and in some situations of our lives, some things have to get out before we can get up. Some things have to get out before you can get up. Get out to worry. Get out to fear. Get out to anxiety. Get out to doubt. Get out from that defeated mindset. Some things have to be released before other things can be resurrected. And so we need to understand that God is a God that wants to heal you. He's a God that wants to resurrect you. But sometimes you've got to release some things and say, get out before you can get up. And that's what we see here with Jairus. Let me finish this real quick. The next person I want to talk about was Jesus. Now the story that we just told was about Jesus. But this story is a place where Jesus says to get out. Matthew chapter 21. The Bible says in verse 12, 
In verse 13, Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. A house of prayer. You know, there's a difference between a house and a hotel, right? We just spent a few weeks, it wasn't in a hotel, it was in a, in a condo of, of somebody that, that we rented it off of, but it wasn't mine. But I treated it as it was mine. I mean, I, you know, was very respectful and we, you know, left things as good a shape as it was when we got there and, you know, we respected it. But when you go to a, like a hotel or something, you really don't care about the electric bill, do you? Just go around, turn all the lights on, you know. Turn the air conditioning down to like 62. You're like, ooh, it's cool in here, you know. Because you, it's not yours. You don't care. You know, you get out of the shower, you dry with all four towels, you know. Like, I ain't mine. I'm just drowning all of them. I don't have to wash them. But when you're home, you, you do things a little different, don't you? Or at least I do. I go around turning the lights off all the time. Don't you know how much electricity costs? Turn these lights off. You know. But when you're in a hotel, you can't just start changing things up you can't rip up the carpet and knock down walls and say hey, i think this will look better over here in certain moments you can't do that because it's not your home right but i like you know going to a hotel staying away it's okay but man there's nothing like sleeping in your own bed can i get an amen there's nothing like your own pillow you know i told angela on this trip i said i ain't gonna be able to sleep i didn't bring my goose down pillow you know anybody ever watch andy griffith you know Forget your goose, the goose down pillow. That's, that was my, me. I couldn't sleep. So it's good to get back in your own bed. Get back in your, you know, it's just nothing like it. And so we have to remember that, you know, that when we go to a hotel or you go and stay or whatever somewhere else, that's not your home, you know. But you also have to remember that earth is not our home. Amen. Earth is not our home. This is not, this is just a temporary land. This is like our hotel, right? It's just where we're staying. The Bible says in Romans 12, to, to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. Why? Because this isn't our home. We shouldn't be conformed to this world. We should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The Bible says that we should be ambassadors for Christ, meaning that we have a home country and it's not here. It's in heaven and we're an ambassador. What an ambassador does is he represents presents his home country in the foreign country that he's in and we're in a foreign country we're in a sinful world this isn't our home we shall be ambassadors for Christ and when the ambassador starts loving the foreign land greater than he does his homeland he becomes a traitor I don't want to be a traitor for Christ I want heaven to be my home it is our home in heaven Jesus said to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, then all these other things will be added to you. If you will seek first the kingdom of God, your home is in heaven. That's where our priority should be. Heaven should be our priority. And if you really want to live a messed up life, if you really want to live a frustrated, unfulfilled, unsatisfied, miserable life with no joy and no pre peace, then you need to start treating the eternal things like they're temporary and temporary things like they're eternal because there's nothing that'll cause you to be more miserable than when you start treating earthly things as if they're going to last forever and heavenly things as if they're going to pass away. Amen? If you want to be miserable, just start treating things that are temporary as if they're going to be eternal. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I love where we live. I love our region that we live in. I love Virginia. I love the United States. You know, they, Lee Greenwood sings, God bless America or God bless the USA. I, I just start, my tear just runs down my cheek, you know. I'm patriotic. I love this country, but it's not my home. My home is in heaven. We need to understand that one day Jesus is going to come back. The clouds are going to split and he's going to come for his people. The Bible says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord he's coming one day to take us home hallelujah this isn't our home 
Heaven is our home. And it's until you start living as if heaven is your home, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be miserable. The Bible says in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the, I like what he says, I reckon. That sounds like he's from Honecker, you know. I reckon that the suffering of this present times is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Knowing heaven is our home gives us a different perspective on life. Not just different priorities, but it gives us a different perspective. Your situation may not change, but your perspective can change when you realize that heaven is our home. Jesus goes into the temple and he calls it the house of prayer. He says, my house of prayer is his house and he defines because it's his house what his house is going to be called and he calls it a place of prayer he doesn't call it a place of singing he doesn't call it a place of preaching he doesn't call it a place of worship he doesn't call it a place of fellowship and all that is well and all that is good and we should be doing all that we should be singing praises to the Lord we should be preaching the gospel we should be worshiping the Lord we should have fellowship one to another but this house is a house of prayer and Jesus is the only one who can define what his house is and he says his house is a house of prayer he is the only one who is prophet priest and king there were people in the Bible that were prophets there were other who were priests there were others who were king but Jesus is the only one that's all three it's his kingdom it's his worship it's his house and he has the power and authority to kick people out amen you want to talk about power and authority to, to turn over tables after church today go to a restaurant go to Texas Roadhouse and just start turning over tables just go in and start turning tables over and throwing chairs see how long it lasts you'll be calling me uh, pastor I'm in jail you can come down here and bail me out I've uh, caused a ruckus down here at the Texas Roadhouse because you told me to go turn over tables and throw chairs it wouldn't last long why because you have no authority to do that you have no power to do that but Jesus it's his house he has the power and the authority to do it and when he does it he says you made my house a den of thieves of corruption and robbery and what started out as a service had become a sham See, the law required for you to bring sacrifices to the, to the temple. And so for, to, for convenience purposes, they would set up a table outside of the temple so people who came wouldn't have to worry about bringing doves and pigeons and lambs and all that. They could just buy their sacrifice when they got there because it would be hard to keep two doves in your pocket, you know, for a long journey or try to keep the pigeons in, in bay for a long period of time or to keep the lamb without getting spots on it, without it getting blemishes, without it bumping into something to keep it until you got to the temple. So they, as a service, they provided where well, you could do that. But over time they it had been been corrupted and they moved it from the outside of the temple to the inside of the temple and then when you got there they would say things like oh well those doves just don't look good I, as a matter of fact i can't use those doves but just for today i've got a special just for you i don't tell other people about it but they get these two doves buy one get one free you know and so they begin to sell the doves and to sell the pigeons and to sell the the, the lambs and that kind of thing there in the temple and so you say well okay i guess i'll have to buy something because i got to sacrifice i got to you know do what the law says and so you pull out your money and you're like whoa, whoa that money's no good here i have to have temple money well i don't have temple money oh we can fix that see that over there that's a money changing table you go over there you give your money they'll always change it for temple money and then you can come over back come back over here and buy your doves or buy your sacrifice you say okay you, that's fine so you go to the temple to the to the money changing table and you say well I, you know i've got a dollar here Oh, that's only good for 15 cents. What? 15 cents? So then you have to keep giving more and more money. It was a, it was a racket. It was a corruption. It was a money racket. It was, they had uh, crazy exchange rates, and they would tell people that their sacrifices were no good. And corruption happened not in an instant, but over increments. And over time, corruption had slipped into the temple. And if we're not careful, what happened to our lives as well. Corruption don't happen overnight. It happens in small increments. And what was supposed to be a help was a hurt. And Jesus sees the corruption. He cleanses the temple and he calls it a house of prayer. 
Well, prayer is nothing but communion with God. It's a communication with him. It's a connection with him. And a house of prayer is a place where folks can come in and they can connect with Jesus. A church should be a house of prayer. It's a place where you can come and connect with Jesus. You connect with his presence. You connect with his power. But you do that through prayer. The Bible says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And that you are not your own, but you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. You don't have control or you shouldn't have control over your own life. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the body is his home. This is the temple of God. Your body is Jesus' home. It's not his hotel. It's his home. He lives within you. And if he wants to paint something, he can paint something. And if he wants to re-brick the outside, he can re-brick the, brick the outside. And if he wants to tear up the carpet or knock down a wall, he has the ability to do that because it's his house it's not his hotel he has the power and the authority to come in and to turn tables over in your life and to run out things that shouldn't be there anything that's blocking the connection of God anything that's blocking communion with him he has the right to tell it to get out he has the right in your life to tell you this needs to get out anything that disconnects and detaches from him he has the authority and the power to go into his home your temple his temple your body and say get out and yet we treat as if God's a renter we treat him as if we can evict him instead of him evicting us don't you like it when people come and visit your home? Boy, nobody said anything. That's why I haven't been invited, I guess, right? People come and visit, what do you usually tell them? Make yourself at home. I tell people that. Make yourself at home. My yard needs mowed. Dishes need to be washed. That's what you do at your home. You come to my house, you do the same thing, right? Make yourself at home. Clean my laundry. Weed to eat, you know. That's what needs to be done, so... But they come and they visit and you welcome them and you're inviting and I'm sure if I come and, and stayed with you, you would just make me so welcome and make me feel like a king, right? Some of you have recently done that. You went and visited family, you visited friends, they just make you feel special. But what happens if you start disrespecting or you start being rude, start leaving trash laying all around, right? Start breaking things. I mean, at some point, you're going to get to the point that you're just going to say, get out, Right? Get out. You'll be like Uncle Phil with DJ Jazzy Jeff. You grab him by the seat of the pants and throw him out the door, right? Does anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Fresh Prince. That's what it's going to be like. Just get out. Get out. I'm tired of you being here. Jesus has the ability and the power and the authority to say get out. And the Bible says he said get out to all them who sold and bought in the temple. Those who bought as well as those who sold. It wasn't just the money changing table. It wasn't just the people who was ripping them off with doves and, and, and lambs and those type of things. It was the people who was buying as well. He lumped them all into one big group, one big category. And he kicked them all out the door at the same time. It's a wholesale. Everything must go. And he kicks them all out at one time. Get out, he says. Get out. It's a wholesale. Should have been a place of purity. Should have been a place of promise. But now they had made it perverse and profane. And what should have been a sanctuary for the righteous had become a refuge for the wicked. And Jesus serves an eviction notice. He tells them to get out. And sometimes you have to do that in your life. Get out to selfishness. Get out to self-centeredness. Get out to my way. Get out to my agenda. Get out to tradition. Get out to rituals and to religious ceremonies. And get out to me just coming to church and going through the motions. And me just coming and sitting on a pew and raising my hands and giving a few dollars an offering. Get out to all those things and get back to what God says. It should be a house of prayer. Get out to the same old, same old 
get out to the routine get out to the dull get out to the pouring get out to, to what I've made it Lord I've made worship something that it shouldn't I've made church something that it shouldn't be get out to all of that mindset and have a fresh start with God he wants you to have a fresh start with him and to make his house your temple a house of prayer to make your body a house of prayer real quickly look what happens verse 14 says and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them see when things get out miracles take place when things get out, God can move in and do what he was supposed to do to start with. Then look at verse 15. And when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were very displeased. Them old chief priests and Pharisees, they were displeased because the children... We're crying out. Listen, you want to see your children? You want to see a younger generation? You want to see young people coming to church, flocking to church? Then there's some things you got to get out and some things you got to usher in. And if you'll usher in Jesus, you'll usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit, then miracles can take place. And the praises of the youth will fill the place. The praises of young people will fill the place. Why? Because the presence of God is there. Sometimes you've got to get things out before things can move in. And we say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've made it. Lord, I'm sorry for the mess that I've created. Lord, I'm sorry that I've allowed this to be moved in, not just into the church, but in into your own life, into your, his temple. And you say, God, I need to get it out. God, I need to get it out. It moves in, not in, in an instant, but it's moved in increments. And we have to say, Lord, I want to get it out. Lord, I want to get it out. Let's get it out. Let's get it out of our lives. Let's get it out of our lives.